Welcome back to the masterclass that I'm making on the Nimzo Indian defense. This is going to be chapter three, and it is the final chapter that looks at 4e3. Now, we castle here as a reminder, and they have three options. In chapter one, we looked at bishop d3. In chapter two, we looked at knight ge2. And now we are going to look at a3. Now, a3 is not so common. Uh, it's not so logical either. Uh, very often, by playing e3, their objective is to open up and develop one of these pieces. But it is still a possibility, really, at any stage. Whatever they play, a3 is always something you should consider. So we are going to spend some time looking at this, and luckily we have a very nice way to deal with a3. Now, first we're going to take here. There's no reason to go back because by taking, we are ruining their structure. Now, this master class is very much based on d5 systems, but we don't play d5 here because if we play d5, we allow them to deal with their doubled pawns. They can take and no longer have these weaknesses on the c-file. So for this reason, we're going to switch our mentality, and instead of playing a light square setup, we're going to play uh, and put our pawns on dark squares. So we're going to play d6 here. And one of our main ideas is to advance in the center with e5. Now, more often, uh, and more common than this is to play b6 and to develop the bishop still going for a dark square system, but more on the queen side with a fianchetto. But I actually find that playing d6, e5, and then playing the bishop to e6 is a more effective way to get the bishop involved uh, where it can control multiple diagonals. Um, and you'll see that this tends to work really good for black. Now we're going to consider two options they have. Knight ge2 doesn't make much sense because if they were going to play knight ge2, they should have done that before invoking us to take here because the only purpose or the main purpose is to defend so they don't have to get this uh, crippled pawn structure. So we're going to focus on the more logical options, which are bishop d3 and knight to f3, simply developing in the most standard way. Let's begin with bishop to d3, which is indeed the main option that white has at their disposal. We play e5 immediately, we expand in the center, and one of the nice things, by the way, about both moves is that we're now threatening to go e4 with tempo, expand further, and take more control in the center. So they're going to look at uh, dealing with this, and there's a few ways they can do so. None of them really work. If they go e4, we already have some nice tactical ideas. Uh, specifically, we take on d4 and then take on e4. Uh, of course, with the pin along the e-file, if they were to take, we go rook to e8, um, and after f3, we can go f5, and we're totally winning the piece back. Their king is also exposed, and we're opening the position up, so that's definitely not going to be uh, good for them. You must be careful, though, and precise, because if you go queen e7 instead of rook e8, they can try queen to e2. Uh, and if the rook was here, we would still have f5 with the attack along the queen and king, but obviously f5 here is useless because we're not going to win material, it's just going to be a trade, and so you want to achieve uh, the tasks with the least valuable piece, and this is a great uh, example of that, so rook to e8 is, is uh, the move here. And if they don't take, uh, I should note, you know, if they just play knight e2, then we have total dominance in the position, our knight is super strong, we have good control in the center, we've won some material, Nothing to complain about here. So, that's one option they have. They can try f3 as well to defend the expansion, but again, this does not work because we can go e4 anyways because they're weakening this diagonal, so we're going to take advantage of this. If they take with the pawn, we can take, and in the end, we have a beautiful fork, uh, plus the queen is active, plus the rook's attacked, and their king is going to be exposed. Again, total domination. And if they decide to no longer uh, allow us to get this fork with knight f3, we, we want a pawn, we can support this knight with f5. If need be, we can retreat it at some point. We've done very good uh, to take good control in the center, and their king is still, uh, to at least some degree, exposed. Um, other than that, I mean, quickly I should mention, if they were to take with the bishop, it's a very similar process. We can uh, take and then continue with this check, we can 
expand later with f5, very similar ideas. So for these reasons, they can't really defend or stop e4. So they have to more or less just develop their, their pieces and allow e4. But of course, e4 is good for us. We're expanding in the center. And here, they can move to two squares. We'll cover both, but they're fairly similar. For example, bishop e1. We develop again. I like the bishop developed on this diagonal where it's attacking the pawn more than on this diagonal because here it's also aimed a little bit at the king. It's more centralized um, and it supports the potential of going d5. And here they have a couple of options. Let's say they defend the pawn. We now develop our knight, and of course the idea is to go knight to a5. Let's say they castle knight a5. We're attacking the pawn further, um, and we're definitely going to, to do some good progress here. Before we continue in that line, quickly I should mention, for those who are worried about d5, we have a nice tactical opportunity. We let them get this fork in order to improve both of our knights really quickly, we're targeting f2, which would be a fork. We're also going to uh, inevitably open up the f-file, which is, again, uh, where the king lands. And we're just going to have a ton of pressure, immediate compensation for the material. So they're probably just going to castle getting away from that. But now we attack the pawn. We can play b6 to defend the knight. And, you know, there's a, uh, many ways that this position could uh, proceed. But ultimately, we're going to take control over the d-file via this d7 square, and even though their rook might land on d1, the knight can now maneuver and either block the rook, or um, if the rook stops that, let's say the rook tries to advance and get in front of the knight, well then we just win a pawn. Uh, so either way, we're very happy. Quickly, I'll show the small differences, uh, more or less insignificant differences with bishop to c2. We again go bishop e6, they defend, and we continue. This fork, again, uh, doesn't work because of the same reasons. There's no big difference uh, with the bishop on b3 or a2. And if they choose to instead continue something like knight to f4, again, not going for the fork, well, then we can attack also their bishop here. That's a slight benefit. Their queen can't come in immediately. Their bishop has to waste a move leaving, and it was attacked. So, it is slightly improved for us. We can, for example, strike very quickly now, get our pieces all aligned, um, and this is a very good position. If they ever take, then our rook will shine. If they don't take, they're going to have big problems in the center, um, and their bishops will never really open up. Their bishops look good, but that's only a visual uh, appearance. They're not actually doing anything significant. Meanwhile, we can, of course, also play on this other side of the board which is um, very much a likely uh, probability that we're going to make good progress there. So that basically covers uh, bishop d3. Not dangerous. We go e5, and we're going to cause mayhem. Now, knight to f3, we also play e5. Again, I like consistency here. We're going for a similar idea with e4. We're going to look at a couple of options. First, if they take, it might seem like they're winning a pawn, but they're not really. We can improve our knight and then improve the other knight as well, and they're up a pawn temporarily, but with the big pressure they have on this uh, pawn here, this knight will soon uh, no longer be able to defend, and then this knight can come in, and our knights are just doing really good pressure here. We're going to win back one of these pawns. Uh, we can even trade, and for example, this is a, a very easy way where we're either going to ruin their structure and then take, um, or I guess we could start by taking, and then also take this pawn, their whole structure is ruined, there's many ways to play this, their king is in the center, an overwhelming advantage, um, at least positional advantage for black here. So, going back, taking uh, and going for the greedy approach of winning the pawn is not um, sufficient. So going back to bishop g4, they're not going to take here, they're probably going to maybe play h3, uh, just sort of ignore um, the bishop, not do anything to um, concrete in the center, they could castle alternatively. Either way, at some point when they tempt us, we're going to be able to take and actually just take control in the center. And we're going to play very much a similar structure to what we've played in the previous variations. We're going to go b6, c5 to lock up the center. We have good control. And this sort of way of maneuvering our pieces with the knight coming to a5, the queen 
just moving and letting the rooks come in. And then playing c5 is really advantageous for us because it might seem like they're getting the d file, but that's not true. We're going to be able to contest that very quickly. And we have really good control on many of the squares on this d file with the pressure also on c4 and perhaps even on this pawn, um, the maneuvering abilities and the rook coming to the center. Uh, we definitely have equalized and are fighting for a, a nice, comfortable advantage. So um, going back after knight to f3, they can try uh, other options. We go obviously e5, and now instead of bishop e2, they can try, for example, knight to d2. Now, the idea of knight to d2 is to try to, again, slightly um, disencourage this move e4, even though we still uh, can play it at some point. Um, and the other idea is to perhaps prepare e4 for white and then try to really stop it. We're going to play bishop to f5. Um, by the way, just as a, a side note, let's say they go, do go e5. We have very much the same tactical idea. It hasn't changed whatsoever. Um, we still have this idea with going f5. So this is a, a common idea that you might see time and time again. So uh, e5, knight to d2. But instead of uh, immediately doing something in the center, we can play a very... Uh, slow, steady approach. We go bishop f5. We're developing the bishop to a much more active square. And the idea is to stop them from developing actively. Usually the bishop comes to e6, but this is a rare case where it's very strong and very hard to target. On f5, there's two attempts. One is to attack it with the center pawns with f3. The other one is to attack it with the queen. With queen to f3, both fail. Let's begin with queen to f3. We're going to defend the bishop, and we're actually going to get this sort of position where their queen will actually get into some sort of trouble. For example, rook to b6, and then we already have some nice tactical ideas. If they take, we take here with check and then recapture. So they're going to have to move back, but now our bishop activates. Then we can even just trade and go for something like queen to e5. Um, and with the many ideas that we have in this sort of position. Um, for example, bishop to d3 is one. The other one is to just play on this king side here. We're definitely happy. Uh, and in exchange for this one small insignificant pawn on b7, that's a very small price to play for the magnitude of ideas that we are given. So f3 seems to be the more adequate way to try to deal with a, a position like this. But this doesn't work that well either. We can develop knight to c6. Um, they're trying to strike in the center, so we're going to try to get more pressure in the center as well with our pieces. They go e4, we simply hop back, and now they do have some issues with the center. And we're actually happy if they play d5, which again, we're kind of tempting them because of the pressure we're posing in the center, because after d5, they have a very permanent issue here. They no longer can play c5. Our knight can sit... Um, on a5, the other knight can come as well, and we're going to be able to put pressure on these pawns. Even if not, though, these pawns are just harming their development. They're not good assets. They're, they're just interrupting the flow of their position. So we can even sacrifice the pawn and get into a similar position if they allow us by trading the knights. Otherwise, we can play very much in the same uh, ideas and setups that we've been employing thus far. But as I showed with this variation, sacrificing the pawn on b7 is uh, something that is very common. Here we're winning, uh, obviously, material, and we are just generally very happy. So overall lessons, overall conclusion from this video, this setup with going b6 and then c5 is a very common way to play against their two bishop setup um, when their bishops line up on these diagonals. We like to play these dark square setups with e5 and d6 against um, the setups where they have these two pawns quickly. And we're also happy to get rid of our pawn if we haven't played already b6. We're happy to get rid of the pawn on b7 to get good development, good initiative, uh, and hopefully win material as in this case. So very energetic system, very fun way to play. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Subscribe for the remainder 
of the content in this masterclass. Like this video if you did enjoy and learn something new from it, and I will see you next time. Peace out.